Everyone knows that this started out as this. So is there anything really new to say about Super Mario Bros. 2? Actually, there's a lot. To acquire this information, I accessed Nintendo's warehouse vault and examined their classified files. Okay, that's not true. But after studying interviews, articles, books, and magazines, investigating every anecdotal theory and testing reported glitches, I've compiled all my discoveries here. In this episode of Declassified, I'll break down not just the history, but all the secrets, codes, and forgotten lore for this classic game, detailing information you may have heard, some you've forgotten, and some you've never known. The creation of Super Mario Bros. 2 is a complicated series of events involving an experimental prototype, a Super Mario sequel, two promotional games made for Fuji TV, and the difficult decision to reject the sequel and mario the promotion. But all that was lost on kids in 1988. All they cared about was more Mario. It all began with an experimental development concept. The prototype, programmed by Nintendo partner Systems Research and Development, had two players cooperatively picking up, carrying, throwing, and stacking blocks as they tried to ascend levels, essentially a proof of concept for how a vertically scrolling Mario-like game could work. Newcomer Kensuke Tanabe and Shigeru Miyamoto evaluated the concept, but decided it wasn't fun enough on its own. Miyamoto suggested improving it with side-scrolling Mario-style elements, but for the time being, the idea was put on hold. Meanwhile, due to the booming success of the original Super Mario Bros., Nintendo of Japan acted quickly, and in a mere nine months developed and released a sequel. Super Mario Bros. 2 was in many ways an extension of the first game, offering similar graphics and controls, but tweaking player expectations with poison mushrooms, trickier jumps, and gusty winds. It was challenging, but Japanese gamers were thrilled to have more Mario. The Fuji Television Corporation took note of Nintendo's growth and began talks to cross-advertise with them. Their initial partnership involved a modified promotional version of the original game that used assets from Super Mario Bros. 2 and replaced familiar sprites with celebrities and personalities from Japan's popular all-night Nippon radio show. At the same time, Fuji was preparing an exposition for the following summer. They called it the Communication Carnival Yume Kojo 87, or Dream Factory 87. And while many people are aware of Yume Kojo and the game that shares its name, they don't know how truly massive it was. With cutting-edge technological exhibits, live concerts, hundreds of stations with interactive games, celebrities, and a showcase of upcoming television shows and innovative new products, Dream Factory was a fitting name. The event was inspired by the carnival in Rio de Janeiro, themed with Italian-style masks and represented by Arabian characters dubbed the Yume Kojo family. The marketing campaign began an entire year before the event, and saturated every aspect of Japanese society. Commercials, phone cards, toys, train passes, and even two popular music groups changed their names to include the phrase Yume Kojo. The expo was a cultural phenomenon. As one small segment of the marketing blitz, 
Fuji once again partnered with Nintendo to create a tie-in game. Representatives handed Tanabe a sheet with illustrations of the Expo's theme and mascots and told him to use them in the game. This new project was the perfect opportunity to revisit SRD's vertical platforming prototype. Still, the task of incorporating masks, Arabia, and the title Dream Factory into something coherent and fun wouldn't be easy. They drew heavily on their mega-hit Super Mario Bros. and added just enough exciting new elements to integrate the diverse concepts into a unified gaming experience. They titled it Yume Kojo after the Expo and added the subtitle Doki Doki Panic, which included an onomatopoeia for the sound of a pounding heartbeat. The approximate translation would be Dream Factory, Heart Pounding Panic. And on July 10, 1987, just eight days before the opening day of the Expo, it was released for the Famicom Disk System. Hey, do, do. Oh, Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, Nintendo of America's Howard Phillips would regularly receive new games from Japan. Basically, I play games, evaluate all the new games for him. When Super Mario Bros. 2 arrived, his expectations were high. But the more he played, the more concerned he became. The new gameplay twists proved so challenging that Phillips advised it not be released stateside, saying, This was not a fun game to play. It was punishment. Undeserved punishment. Phillips later quipped, Maybe Miyamoto was depressed at the time he made Mario 2. And though American gamers were clamoring for more Mario, Nintendo of America heeded Phillips' advice. It was a bold move to reject the sequel to the most popular game in the world, but they wisely deemed it too similar to the original and much too brutal for American audiences. Hey, Texas! And furthermore, by the time they'd localized it and converted it to cartridge, it would have been noticeably inferior to the new wave of games from the competition. If Nintendo of America were to release a new Mario game, it needed to be vibrant, friendly to players, and outshine their competition. Their best option was to restructure something that had not been released in the States, and one game in particular stood above the rest. With several key members of the Super Mario Bros. team also behind Doki Doki Panic, much of the game already felt like a Mario title. But to complete the conversion, quite a few changes were made. The title screen was enhanced with a frame showing the characters and a bit of the action to come. Thankfully, the art was also added to the bonus chance minigame. Of course, the most obvious change was the cast. Imogen, his girlfriend Lena, Mama, and Papa were replaced with Mario, Princess Toadstool, Luigi, and Toad, and the character select screen was completely revised. But in early versions, the new cast lacked one defining feature. At one point, their eyes were simple dots, but before release, they added eye whites, giving them a more cartoony look. The Mama character originally had a slow, floaty jump, but when they replaced her with Luigi, it didn't look natural. To help smooth it over, Miyamoto suggested having him kick in the air, and the flutter jump was born. Borrowing from the original Super Mario Bros., they added B-button running, and now characters would become small when they were a hit away from death. Interestingly, these new half-sized characters would have been able to access areas they weren't supposed to go, so the team gave them bigger heads, which added to the cartoony aesthetic. The mask motif from Yume Kojo 87 was a big part of the original game, but in the revision, these were replaced by Koopa shells, and stackable masks were swapped out with a variety of mushroom blocks. The heart power-ups in subspace also became mushrooms, and extra lives, which originally depicted the head of the character you were playing, became one-up mushrooms. Other alterations had little to do with Mario, but were due to changes in the story, the conversion from disc to cartridge, or refinements that simply made for a better game. Doki Doki Panic took place in a storybook, and level intro screens were originally designed to look like pages. In the revision, the book theme was replaced completely by dreams, and chapters became worlds, but many screens retain hints of the initial design. And while many of the Arabian references remain, some of the most frequently appearing elements were altered. Possibly the biggest structural change arose from the disk system's ability to save game data. In Doki Doki Panic, each family member progressed on their own independent track, 
meaning Imogen could be on Chapter 6 and Mama still back in Chapter 2. To truly complete the game, all four characters had to defeat Wart. With game saves, four playthroughs wasn't much of a problem. For the conversion, however, there were no saves, so it was streamlined. Characters could be switched between levels and completing the game required only a single playthrough with any combination of characters. Many objects that were lifeless in Doki Doki Panic were now fully animated for Super Mario Bros. 2. The subtle motions of cherries, vines, clouds, fuses, pow blocks, crystal balls, spiked floors, and every single tuft of blowing grass brought the world to life. Waterfalls, however, which were initially too full of life, were slowed down. With regard to the music, Koji Kondo's original score already contained memorable melodies, but a lot had to be added in the conversion, and without the Disk System's extra sound channel, a lot had to be changed, too. The subspace music went from this to a remix of the classic ground theme from Super Mario Bros. The invincibility theme changed from this to a variation of the Starman theme. And at one point they considered replacing the cave theme with a revised underground theme. But it didn't stick. Several compositions were extended with new phrases giving the overall score a less repetitive richness. The opening music was slowed down, expanded, and moved to the ending. In its place, Kondo added an upbeat title track, a tune which ought to sound familiar. Finally, on October 9, 1988, after such a bizarre development and many months of reframing, Super Mario Bros. 2 was released in America. Super Mario is back. He's blasting through worlds where no one has ever been. He's taking on enemies no one else dares. This time, Mario pops up power wherever he goes, so he's bigger and badder than ever before. You've never seen creatures like these. You've never had an adventure like this. It's everything you've dreamed of and worlds more. It's Super Mario 2, only from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. And while kids didn't know its non-Mario origins, it offered so many advancements over the original, they didn't care. The marketing hype and a chip shortage exacerbated by the almost concurrent release of Zelda 2 made the game notoriously hard to find. You came a thousand miles just for this game? Yeah. I've done seven stores a day for three weeks now. I cannot find it. Nevertheless, it rose to be the best-selling standalone game on the system. Trailing only behind Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt, which came packed with the action set, and eventually Super Mario Bros. 3, which had a pack-in deal of its own. In September of 1992, it received one final salvo on the Famicom hardware when the Mario-fied version was released in Japan as Super Mario USA. Hi, Watashi Kazarin yo. Super Mario USA de teki kara o enjiteru no oto. Amerika ga eri no Famicom soft Super Mario USA. Deki chatta. Like many games from the NES era, the actual story has been ignored into obscurity. According to the manual, Mario dreams about a long stairway leading to a door. When he opens it, he sees a vast world and hears a faint voice pleading for his help. Welcome to Sapcon. We've been awaiting your arrival. Please defeat Wart and return Sapcon to its natural state. Remember, Wart ate vegetables. At this point, Mario wakes up. He meets Luigi, Princess Toadstool, and Toad for a picnic in the mountains, and amidst the beautiful scenery they see a cave, 
When they enter, there's a stairway and a door exactly like the one Mario saw in his dream. They open the door and the adventure in Subcon begins. It went over the heads of many players at the time, but Subcon is short for subconscious, and it's a big clue that Mario never actually woke up from his initial dream. Everyone knows Mario 2 was updated and re-released as part of Super Mario All-Stars on the Super Nintendo, and for the Game Boy Advance release it was enhanced even further with improved sprites, better animations, and new layers of exploration. Let's go. But did you know there was yet another variation on the Super Famicom? Across the spring of 1996, Nintendo broadcast four episodes of BS Super Mario USA Power Challenge for the Satellaview add-on. In each episode, players had to find ten hidden Mario statues scattered throughout recycled versions of the original worlds. During the game, friends and foes would pop on screen and initiate helpful or harmful events, and unlike the original, players had to start as Mario. The rest of the cast only became playable through timed events built into the broadcast. Did you know there was a Super Mario 2 prototype cart found? Most cosmetic upgrades weren't in place, characters couldn't yet run, and there were many other minor differences. Most notably, their eyes hadn't been revised. The cart also contained several debug features. Pressing A on the title screen served as a level select, and pressing select gave you 15 hit points and a scrambled life meter a detail that was hidden right there in the commercial. Super Mario 2 led to unprecedented cultural saturation for Nintendo and Mario in particular. With lunch boxes, a shower hose, folders, drinking glasses, cards, wall stickers, belt buckles, phones, toys, signs, and more, it truly was Mario madness. Did you know the image on the box was just a mirrored image of the original Famicom Mario art? It was recolored and the mushroom was replaced with a vegetable, but it's the same, and he's still missing a finger. As iconic as this artwork is, have you ever noticed Mario's color scheme doesn't match the game? This red-blue confusion was made even more apparent in the Nintendo Power coverage. And did you know the scene on the cover of that first issue was sculpted by Will Vinton Studios, the inventors of Claymation and the studio behind the California Raisins? While there wasn't an official strategy guide, did you know issues 7 and 8 included the two-part inside-out guide breaking down every level of the game? Some have debated whether Mario looks better in the second or third game. The funny thing is, they're essentially the same sprite. Though the games were released two years apart in America, they were developed at the same time in Japan, and regions aside, they were released only two weeks apart globally. As for the rest of the cast, Super Mario 2 added quite a bit to the franchise. Luigi became more than a Mario palette swap, with a taller frame and a flutter kick. Princess Toadstool was refined and temporarily freed from the damsel archetype. The Mushroom Retainer was brought to life with Toad. And it was Mario 2 that brought many other beloved characters into the Mario universe. The Super Mario Bros. Super Show was clearly based on the game with the four playable characters being the protagonists and most of the enemies making appearances. But Wart was nowhere to be found. In fact, with more than a hundred Mario-themed games and several cartoon series, it's hard to believe Wart only appears in one of them. He was mentioned in Paper Mario Color Splash, and there's an unsubstantiated rumor that he had a son, Wart Jr., the cranky frog from Animal Crossing. But other than remakes, Wart has never appeared in a Mario game again. He has, however, appeared in Zelda. In the Game Boy Classic Link's Awakening, which also takes place in a dream, he teaches Link the Frog's Song of Soul. In Japan, his name is Mamu, which is a clever wordplay lost on most of the world. It means Wart, but it's also a syllable flip of Mu Ma, which means nightmare. In fact, the word Mu is used quite a bit in Doki Doki Panic. It literally means nothing, and really fits the Dream Factory storybook themes of the game. Subcon is called Mu Kai, which means opposite. Sniffits are known as Mu Chos, and their bullets are actually evil dreams. And now knowing about Mu and Mamu, the M on the side of the auto bomb finally makes sense. In Japan, Shy Guy isn't a member of the 8-bits as he is in English. Instead, he's a type of Mamu, called a Heiho, which is the syllable flip of Hohei, the Japanese word for infantry. 
The game itself only uses red and pink varieties, but the team also programmed a more intelligent gray shy guy that would follow you. He's in the Japanese manual and even in the code, but he didn't make the final game. Did you know flurries were snow monsters? Or that the Japanese name for porcupo translates to 10,000 year needles? Ninji has the curious description that they're devils who appear in the dreams of NES players. In Japan, it's even more ominous, connoting they invade the dreams of boys who play Famicom. In the game, tweeters are white birds with red masks, but in the artwork, their colors are inverted. Whether intentional or not, their design recalls deep-rooted cultural symbols. In Japan, they look like hybrids of ancient Kotengu masks and the more modern Tengu masks. And in the West, they resemble 14th century plague doctors. Did you know these ladybug-like creatures are the size of basketballs? And for that reason, they were named Hoopsters? With pink skin and a bow-topped head, most players figured Birdo was a girl. And as the character made appearances in future games, this was further emphasized in text and with the use of female voice actors. This is as far as you go! But the manual says he thinks he's a girl, and he'd rather be called Birdetta. Did you know in Japan he's named Catherine? And have you ever stopped to consider that he isn't remotely bird-like, but some kind of reptile? Did you know Mouser's name in Japan is Don Churuge, a name derived from two onomatopoeia? Don, which sounds like a booming sound, Don, and Chu, which sounds like a squeaking mouse. We've got Did you know his bombs destroy good dreams? Or that across the game's many incarnations, Mouser is the most used, yet most displaced boss character, going from three encounters in Doki Doki Panic to two ever-shifting appearances in later games. Triclide has also been affected by this boss battle shuffle, and in the most recent reimagining, is only faced one time. Interestingly, his multi-headed serpentine design harkens back to the Hydra of Lerna from Greek mythology. The manual says Wart gave life to the entity known as Fry Guy, but have you ever thought about the fact that Fire is the boss of the Icy World 4? Did you know Claw Grip is the only true Mario enemy in the game? All the other enemies were designed for Doki Doki Panic, but to break up the repetition of three battles with Mauser, Claw Grip was specifically created for Super Mario Bros. 2. But he's not the only crab to appear in a Mario game. When Mario 2 came out, there were very few enemies in the Mario universe, so the use of the crab-like sidestepper made perfect sense. This connection was solidified in Super Mario Advance, where the character magically changes into Claw Grip, a scene that finally realized the original manual's mysterious description. He grows suddenly. Everyone knows the four characters have distinct abilities, but do you know how deep it goes? Toad has the fastest grab speed, and if you run while carrying something heavy, he actually runs 20% faster. Did you know characters are invincible during their grab animations? And since Princess Toadstool has the slowest grab speed, she actually has the largest window of invincibility. Everyone knows Luigi jumps higher and falls slower than the other characters, but did you know he falls even slower if you hold A? Of course, hearts, stars, and stopwatches occasionally appear, but not everyone knows exactly why. A heart appears after every eight enemies you defeat, an invincibility star ascends after every five cherries you collect, and stopwatches replace every fifth ripe vegetable you pick. Have you ever noticed that the pause music is just the level music minus the melody layer? Did you know there was an unused happy face hiding in the code? Several elements from Doki Doki Panic are still present there. But most surprisingly, the word Zelda is hiding in there too. Presumably, some information was copied from Zelda and reused, as both games were disc-to-cart conversions. Did you know a few errors made it into the final release? In the battle against Fry Guy, for example, shrinking due to being hit by a falling small fry would prevent the door from appearing. Fortunately, a later release fixed the bug. Have you ever noticed there's a frame in the POW block animation where the O shifts left and squishes the P? There's also a frame that's missing. 
In fact, due to a programming error, several objects coded with 8 frames are missing their final frame. As a side note, there's a Game Genie code that fixes it. Axe, New York, Section Z to Texas. In the end credits, Birdo and Ostro are mislabeled, Hoopster is spelled Hoopstar, and Claw Grip is called Claw Glip. These errors were not fixed in later releases. In fact, they weren't even fixed in Super Mario All-Stars. There's only one button combination code worth mentioning, but it doesn't have much use. If you pause the game and press up plus A and B on the second controller, when you unpause, you'll die and restart at the beginning of the level. If you do this while riding a rocket, you'll emerge from the rocket alive, but with no visible health. And if done during a door transition, you'll be trapped in a death loop until all your lives are depleted. There are quite a few glitches in Super Mario Bros. 2. Some of them are useful shortcuts, but most are just oddities that are fun to try. The cave clip, for example, lets you skip bombing this wall and takes you to Birdo a little faster. To do it, get hit by this shy guy to shrink, then jump and immediately press B to pick him up. As you fall into the ladder well, hold left to hug the wall, then quickly throw him to the right. It's important that the shy guy's fall is delayed and that when you hit the bottom you're still flashing with momentary invincibility. Begin climbing and as the shy guy lands on you, he'll actually push you through the floor into Birdo's area. The fast carpet glitch lets you speed through sections with magic carpets. To execute the maneuver, use Toad to hijack the first Pidget's magic carpet. Fly left, then right to spawn another carpet, and position Toad just above the second Pidget. Pick him up, but stay on the original carpet and keep holding B. If timed right, you'll activate Toad's 20% item carrying run speed increase and fly across the level at super speed. If you run full speed and jump right as you're about to hit an enemy, you'll be able to jump again mid-air. The double jump glitch is possible with every character, but easiest to achieve with Luigi. Luigi can also use damage to his advantage. If he has at least three units of health and gets hit from below, he'll be launched into the air. The fast climb glitch is flashy and super fun. To do it, up and down need to be pressed at the same time. Of course, this isn't possible with a standard controller, but it's easy to do in emulation or with a modified NES controller. Normally, when you let go of a climbable object, you begin to fall, but the ladder jump allows you to maintain an upward jumping trajectory. To do it, press an up and to the side diagonal and then jump within three frames of dismounting. In most cases, this just saves a little time, but ladder jumping from this chain in 7-2 allows you to walk on top of the screen without initiating the vertical scroll, allowing you to bypass most of the level. But even cooler, if you play as Luigi, the fast climb and ladder jump glitches can be combined for a mega jump. To execute the glitch, press up and down, then also push to the side to dismount. If you jump within the three-frame window, he'll rocket ridiculously high into the air. When you enter subspace, the overworld theme from Mario 1 plays for the six seconds you're allowed to stay. The actual track, however, includes much more of the song, and there's a glitch to hear it in the game. To pull it off, enter a subspace door while powered up with an invincibility star. Wait at the door and exit on the sixth beat of the song. If timed right, the theme will start over and continue to play. If you exit subspace over a tuft of grass and press B rapidly enough to pick and toss the item before the door disappears, the item will seemingly embed itself in your character's head. You can still move as normal, even grabbing and throwing other items, but as soon as you enter another area, it becomes usable again. A move with interesting implications. Everyone knows about the four warp locations, but there are several more. Using the item head glitch in level 6-1, you can bring a potion into the jar room to access an unintended warp, leading back to the start of 6-1. And stopwatch wrong warping allows you to travel to even stranger places. To execute the glitch, toss a shy guy into the base of a ladder or vine just as the stopwatch is about to expire. With the enemy trapped in the floor, stand on it and jump until you slightly sink onto it. After you pick it up and throw it, you'll be able to climb through the floor 
and warp to another part of the game. Of course, these warps are basically useless, but they're fun to pull off. When an enemy is thrown, it's momentarily upside down. If you're able to throw another enemy into it while it's still upside down, they'll both rise into the sky. Since the window of execution is so narrow, Toad, with his rapid grab speed, makes the trick a little easier. But that's not the only gravity-defying glitch. If you lure a pokey across the stage, it'll ignore physics, passing through walls and walking on air. But most gravity glitches are related to the POW block. If you throw one and immediately grab and toss a vegetable, it'll float off abnormally. If you throw a POW block while standing on a log, the log will fly upward as soon as the screen begins to shake. If you manage to toss one while riding a shell, you can ride it to the sky. In fact, this works with many objects in the game, turning regular items into elevators that lead to game-bending shortcuts. Do you know any interesting bits that I missed? If so, please comment below and I'll add them to a future video. If you like what I'm doing, the highest compliment you can give is recommending the channel to friends and family who might find it interesting. Thank you. And special thanks to all the Retro Club patrons of the channel. You make this possible.